things are gonna get crazy. <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Animate's Crazy Cartoon Cast. How are you all doing? Yes, I have finally returned after my week break because of the holidays and stuff like that. But still, it has just been one week, but still one week where plenty of things have occurred. But still, it is a well-deserved break and enough time for me to go and produce more videos because I definitely had a good amount coming up, especially with this week when I had uh, not just my sole review, but also the top five best and worst animated films of 2020, which things seem to be going extremely well with it. I'm really happy with the results and uh, I'm really glad that you guys especially have enjoyed it as well. Well, but uh, now that I am officially back with Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, but uh, this is also a very special occasion because we are no, uh, we are officially at the beginning of 2021. Yes, the highly anticipated year has finally arrived, and I say highly anticipated mainly because of the fact that people were just so desperate to leave 2020. I think there is uh, no arguing that 2020 has been an absolutely insane year. However, with this episode in particular, I decided I wanted to do something a, a little bit special. Something that has now become a bit of a tradition with uh, Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, where I will not be reporting any of the animation news that has occurred this week. I am aware that there have been some stuff that did happen, including um, the unfortunate stroke of Tom Kane, and I wish him all the best for his health. But what I'm going to do instead is that I am going to have one last look at the year 2020. One last time that we are going to be looking throughout the year 2020, and we are going to be counting down some of the biggest, some of the craziest, some of the most noteworthy news that has happened in 2020 with the world of animation. Yes, folks, this is indeed the top five animation news of 2020. Something that I'm sure by the end of all this, we will all enjoy and not only be a little bit more knowledgeable, but have more of an understanding of what will be coming up in 2021, because a lot of these news will make a very significant impact in our future. And I will say right now that I definitely do hope that not only all of you watching this live right now or listening to this through uh, your podcast service are going to be enjoying this, but hopefully the people on YouTube will also enjoy this as well and not receive the same reception as last year where I ended up getting harassed and attacked by a bunch of Proud Boy style incels just because I called out a sexual predator and his legion of conservative grifters. <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't happen again with this one. <laughs> okay, but anyways... With all that said, hopefully you shall all be ready for this little list I have over here. Not only are we going to be looking back at some of probably more recent news, but probably also some news that has happened way back in the beginning of the year. Like stuff that even occurred before the pandemic. And I'm just going to say it right now that not all the news on this list is related to the coronavirus. So with all that said and done, I would like to know from the chat wall, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me hear it. Are you ready for the top five animation news of 2020? Okay, let's see. Yes, yes, yes. That is beautiful. That is great to see. Okay, that's wonderful. People are now all set and ready to start this one off. So with all that said and done, it is now time that we are going to be taking this list and get things started. 
And with our first one that we have over here coming in at number five is something that has occurred recently. In fact, what I'm gonna be talking about shall be regarding a viral sensation. Now, usually when an animated feature gets popular on the internet, it's often for weird reasons. Sometimes uh, with movies like Shrek or B-Movie, it's out of the sheer randomness where people just turn it into a massive thing bigger than probably the movie itself. However, when it comes to this one right over here, this is actually a meme that actually has done more good. In fact, uh, that is actually something that you can rarely say about memes nowadays. Very rarely do we ever experience a meme that actually does have the power of good and that it helps unite people together for a good cause. And what I'm going to be talking about is going to be at number five, Ratatouille the Tick Tock Musical. And uh, with the whole thing about this TikTok musical is that this actually started out as just a little trend that happened on the social media platform TikTok, where this one individual here by the name of uh, Emily Jacobson, she actually started out on TikTok where she decided to mix her love of both Disney and stage musicals and combine them together uh, in order to create a cute little video, which is kind of like... Uh, an ode to Remy, per se. A, a cute little tribute to Ratatouille and just make up a little song based on uh, the 2007 Pixar film. Where it was literally her with a chipmunk voice where she would sing... Uh, where was the lyrics? Ah, yes, it's right over here, which I'm going to be using my source here on Deadline, as it says... <clears throat> Remy the Ratatouille, the rat of all my dreams. I praise you, my Ratatouille. May the world remember your name. And somehow, that little jingle, that little ode to Remy, became largely, it just became larger and larger and larger, where more TikTok followers and more TikTok people decided to share this, to present the video, and somehow became a massive sensation, where theater fans decided to look at this and decide to go and expand the concept of what Emily started with Ode to Remy, where they would go and make their own versions of uh, Ode to Remy with doing little remixes or really liven it up to feel like it's more of a Broadway production of it or even make their own music and create their own songs inspired by Ratatouille based on several different moments that would occur in the film and then uh, not only that but it then suddenly got even bigger when suddenly professionals in the industry including those who have worked on Broadway started to step in and actually add more into this um, fictionalized Ratatouille musical where they would all develop some uh, crazy ideas of what they want to do w uh, for this Ratatouille musicals uh, where you would have some that would develop uh, costumes, some would develop concept uh, puppets for the rats, some would develop sets and designs of the overall look of the Ratatouille musical. And think up about all these different ideas, even especially like choreography uh, for some of the songs that have been invented for this. They all got together, so both professionals and fans alike have decided to group up in order to go and create this uh, concept of what would a, a an entire Ratatouille musical would look like. But then came Sea View Productions, in which they decided to really take this concept to the max. And uh, just recently, they have actually provided uh, a special little production, a virtual, a, 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 a virtual concert per se, of Ratatouille the TikTok musical in which it's pretty much a virtual stage show where you actually got an all-star cast uh, performing as the characters in the show uh, from the movie and they would actually uh, pay their little tribute singing some of the popular songs that went viral on TikTok for this um, little uh, for this little idea and not only that but it was actually all done for the Actors Fund, which is uh, 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 an organization, a nonprofit organization that would go and help out 
actors who are struggling, uh, actors uh, who are having a hard time to make a living or to earn some revenue to 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 go and do like uh, essential things like buying food and paying rent and stuff like that. So it's really to go and help them out. And apparently, uh, as I am recording this, it was actually just yesterday where they put on the uh, uh, this little special show of Ratatouille the Musical, in which it actually did feature uh, a bit of an all-star cast. Uh, if I may look into here, there's this one section that did list some of the actors that did uh, appear in this Ratatouille musical. Some of these actually include uh, Titus Burgess as Remy himself. You also got Kevin Chamberlain as Gusteau, uh, Adam, Lev uh, Adam Lambert playing as Emil, Wayne Brady playing as Django. Um, you got Ashley Park as Colette, and those are just uh, several different examples of different actors who came in and decided to volunteer their time in order to perform the uh, Ratatouille musical. And I believe uh, there was one little moment where even Emily Jacobson herself actually did make a cameo in this uh, little musical. Apparently, you could still go and check it out right now, or at least as I am recording this, because um, they, like, they are putting it up uh, for 72 hours while still raising funds for the, uh, tick, uh, for the Actors Fund. And apparently, the result of this little production actually turned out to be a very massive hit. And I mean, like, even by Broadway standards, it was very successful. Because this TikTok musical actually managed to raise over $1 million for the Actors Fund. And this is like a little production where, like, technically, if you want to buy a ticket to go see this uh, virtual production, then you'd have to go and um, pay like at, at least a minimum of five dollars or something like that but uh, there are also extra amounts that you can also pledge uh, in order to support the actors fund and stuff like that and by the way this is all uh, I did forget to mention that with this uh, little musical that there is an update regarding how how Disney does view this whole situation and while there are no current plans to actually make an official Ratatouille musical they are highly aware of of um, what TikTok is doing with Ratatouille, and they are absolutely loving it. In fact, uh, the head of Di of uh, Disney's theatrical productions, Thomas Schumacher, uh, even gave his okay to let this happen. So, Dis so like the the good news is that Disney is not going towards a Nintendo route with this, and they're perfectly fine with this. They are perfectly cool. So with all this, uh, basically the big thing to go and highlight is basically uh, the virality of Ratatouille the musical. How this crazy idea of just uh, turning this stage, at, uh, turning this 2007 Pixar movie and turn that into a major stage adaptation. Well, it, 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 uh, chances are it might not actually happen, but still like this idea really was crazy and how big it actually really grew and became like one of the biggest uh, phenomenons that occurred on TikTok. But one thing that I will say about this is that I definitely do find that with the oh actually uh before i continue i just want to say um a very special thanks to yummy199 for the uh, subscription that is uh, really awesome of you uh anyways uh, going back to to this what i want to say about ratatouille the tiktok musical as i said before uh this is one of the extremely rare occurrence where a viral sensation or a meme ended up uh, doing a lot more good to the community. It, like this, 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 something like this has never happened uh, in our culture since back like years ago with uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge. You may remember with uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge where people were taking bucket, were literally taking like buckets of like really cold water with ice in them and just dumping it on their heads and all doing it uh, while uh, donating to ALS or even raising awareness to ALS. And this is exactly the same thing what this uh, musical has done, because let's face the reality of the situation. Uh, if there is one industry that the coronavirus has definitely hit the hardest, one of them is undeniably the theater industry. In fact, throughout the grand majority 
of the year, uh, places like the West End and even Broadway have been closed off. There have been no productions of anything uh, that has happened in a very long time, and it unfortunately left a lot of people without a job, especially uh, when it comes to actors. And this is definitely a year that I can say that actors have really suffered the most, and especially, like, struggling actors. Yeah, like, you got, like, the major celebrities, like, they're gonna be fine with their millions of dollars, but uh, with the ones that, like, they're still, go, you know, they're still trying to reach the, t the top, the non-recognizable names, they definitely had a massive hard time because they really lost... Uh, a medium that they would constantly use in order to gain some revenue. They can't go into stage, and even in film productions, they would have a hard time to get into. And, uh, and, and, it, and it pretty much left them no choice, but really, if they want to do any more acting jobs, then the only option was maybe voice acting, and that's it. So it really is a tough time for them. And this is just actors. Like, this is not even to mention about, like, the set designers, the costume designers, uh, the, the lighting people, and, and so much more. Like, this industry has affected... so Like, uh, the, the, this pandemic has affected so many jobs. And the beauty of this uh, Ratatouille musical, this uh, viral phenomenon that occurred on TikTok, is that it helped kept the spirit of stage musicals alive. Uh, even though uh, even though nowadays uh, you can't really go out and actually watch a stage production of something like The Lion King or The Phantom of the Opera, theater fans and theater professionals alike all decided to come together and keep their creative juices flowing and keep the spirit of theater alive by creating this idea of turning Ratatouille into a musical. And especially... Uh, one thing that does make it beautiful is how it resulted in this Ratatouille TikTok musical in which it turned out to be a massive hit and, like I said before, raised over a million dollars for the Actors Fund to really help out uh, actors or uh, theater professionals in need, uh, especially during this time when they don't really have much of a job. And it is honestly a little bit difficult nowadays to find a job during these times as well. So the good news for that is that, um, like, it, it, it's not just, uh, you know, you know, it's not just a fun thing to be involved with and thinking of, thinking about, like, crazy ideas of how you can add your contribution to the Ratatouille musical, but this is also something that really shows how the theater community is really sticking together during these tough times and helping each other out. And one thing that I will say um, that uh, when it comes to Ratatouille, I feel like the more I think about it, the more it really does feel like this Ratatouille, like, I, I, the more I feel like Ratatouille is actually the perfect subject for them to actually turn into a musical. Because if you have seen Ratatouille, then you probably know the moral of Ratatouille, the message of anyone can cook. It, it, it's pretty much the motto of Chef Gusteau in the movie, and it really is a message that they try to really emphasize in um, the movie to show that even a rat can become a professional chef in Paris. And in this case here, um, what, what they have presented is that, yes, anyone can cook, because a lot of the contribution that uh, this musical has provided, that um, this musical has provided, it, like not all of it comes from like Broadway professionals and stuff. This is fans. This is like a fan-made production that grew into a phenomenon that even the professionals uh, came in to help them out. This is like really, this is really a production for fans by fans, and it really shows the talent that these people have that really grew into something that's massively big, and it helped them become more of a popular, uh, you know, it really did help them to go and follow their dreams and to show how they can cook in the theater production using this Ratatouille musical as an example. It's like one step ahead in order to go and follow their dreams to go and become uh, like th theater professionals to work in the industry, rather it be as an actor or even like as a set designer, a costume designer, a choreographer, or, or so much more, just an example. But still, like, honestly, 
as I said before, this is one of the very rare memes that has actually done a lot more good in this world. Never since uh, the uh, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge has it that has a meme really helped out the community so much. And this is why I'm putting this at the number five spot because not only did this become, uh, not only did it take an animated movie and turn that into a viral sensation, but it really did so much good for a community that needed so much help during these tough times so that's why i put this at the number five uh might as well start this one off with a very uplifting beginning with ratatouille the tiktok musical okay so with that said i would like to go into the chat wall and i want to go and ask you all uh what is your opinion regarding the whole ratatouille tiktok musical and also one thing i want to know if you guys have seen the uh, production of ratatouille the tiktok musical i would love to know your thoughts on it because so far all i've been all i have been hearing about this is nothing but absolute praise people were just adoring uh the what they what uh c view productions has done with uh, ratatouille the tiktok musical so let me know what you think about this Oh, okay, so here we go. We actually, I think someone has actually seen it. <clears throat> uh, let's see. This musical was really well done. Me and my mom watched it yesterday and paid for the $15 ticket. I really love how the music actually furthers the story instead of the story stopping so they could just sing a song. And I and uh, continuing the story, everything went perfectly well. It is a great first half of a great musical and I can't wait to see a Broadway production uh, ever picks up and makes it a real musical it is the best thing that came out of disney in 2020 well not really because th th that's the whole thing about this like even though disney did approve this this is not necessarily an actual disney thing like i said before this is actually a production that was done for fans by fans this is all unofficial this is not officially licensed by disney but because of the amount of goodness that has uh, that it, it has done to the theater community, Disney allowed it. They know when they see something that is actually bringing out more positivity when they see it. So th th that's one thing I want to emphasize is that, yes, I mean, this is all a Disney thing, but it's not officially licensed from Disney. Uh, let's see. This was an amazing idea. I'm just extremely happy that this passion project became a reality and became successful. Considering how the pandemic has damaged the theater community, it is extremely beneficial for the theater performers and keep them safe and healthy during these times. And at least this is a meme that can do more good than harm. Also, I think it would be a good idea for Disney to put a film version of the Broadway shows on Disney Plus similarly to what they did on Hamilton. I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of a different subject, but I definitely do see what you mean. Like, I, I definitely do see what you what you are talking about. And some people did petition that maybe for Broadway productions like Frozen or even Aladdin that they would actually film what's been on stage and they would put that onto Disney Plus. Like, that would actually be a fantastic idea. Uh, but you know, that would also be pretty cool as well if they would take. Um, what has been done with this TikTok musical and they would turn that into an actual full-on movie then honestly I feel you know honestly that would be awesome for Disney to do like to, re to really help them out and even put that onto Disney plus and you know even better also like the, I know it sounds crazy and maybe that sounds too much but even put in the premium access where they would put that premium access and all the proceeds of that would go to the actors fund. So they would continue uh, donating to them, you know, like to keep that tradition of what the Ratatouille, the TikTok musical has started, you know, I, I, like, I, I don't know about you, but yeah, I would definitely like to see Disney pick this one up. Like what, what has been filmed uh, by Seaview and they would just put that onto Disney plus. I think it would be very beneficial, especially if they can actually, make people pay for it and the proceeds could end up going to the actors fund all right anyways um uh let's see what we got here i would never know that all the movies get uh that all the movies to get a musical ratatouille managed to become one i congratulate the people for this production to make this become a reality i might not have tiktok but i might give it a chance to check it out when i get the chance all right nice dude uh let's see what else do we got here 
Uh, the fact that a meme like this could grow so much and truly help others is just amazing and I will certainly look it up later. I am also glad that Disney didn't take the Nintendo route and shout BAN HAMMER TIME! I also got a question for you. Which other Disney Pixar movie do you want to see turn into a musical next? That is a good question, actually, and, uh, well, <laughs> well, I can say that technically Toy Story did get turned into a musical, but not like a Broadway musical, kind of like a special stage production that, that is for the parks, like on the Disney Cruise Line, and for, uh, I think at one point in Disney's California Adventure, but I, I will say, I actually did see it once uh, at the Disney Cruise Line, and it was actually pretty solid, I do recommend it. But if there is another one, well, and then technically you could also say there was the Finding Nemo musical as well uh, that was on Animal, uh, that is on Animal Kingdom. There is that. Um, oh, you know what? Considering that it just got released, they they, they could do one for uh, uh, for Soul. Actually, you know, you want, you know what, uh, Soul or maybe Coco as well. Considering both of them, like they have prominent themes of music, where Coco is highly based on Latin music, whereas Soul is based on jazz music. Those can actually be turned into great musicals, and I could see them make some amazing ideas with that as well. So I think honestly, like both of those, I think would be the easiest answer to turn into musicals. But also another one I would say as a bit of an honor mention I could definitely see them turn uh, inside out into a musical I think that could actually be a pretty solid idea okay uh let's see what else do we got here uh oh okay here we go uh this is a cool idea I actually just joked with my friends uh that we should rent a local community theater and do Armageddon the musical it's a jukebox musical and we intend to be as cheap as hell like the night man cometh Oh my god, I can that could actually be so funny, dude. Oh my god. I I would not be against that idea. Like like imagine just like a a simple like one dollar production and you got everybody like everybody coming together holding hands just singing I don't wanna close my eyes I don't wanna fall asleep cause I miss you baby and I don't wanna miss the thing <laughs> Oh my god, or like everybody's singing normally and then you got the one guy, no, the one guy who plays Bruce Willis's son coming, or not, or, or like son-in-law technically, coming in and like he would be the one singing like Steve Tyler, that would be beautiful. Oh my god, yo, get, go at it, man. I, do, do it, definitely go and do that. Uh, let's see, I'll go and read one more comment before we jump on to number four. Uh, let's see now. My best friend, uh, my best friend is a theater guy, and he wants me to have some of his theater friends voice characters in a production we're working on. Because of the virus, uh, it's a, a lot of them can volunteer freely. Uh, I'm glad to help the theater community. Now I want a Cars musical where everybody is on roller skates. A Cars musical with roller skates. I mean, it's not impossible of an idea. I guess I'm not a big fan of the Cars movies. I'll be honest, but. You know, car, but instead of making it about cars like they're on roller skates, I can see that. Okay, that that is an interesting way, like kind of make you know, kind of like give that extreme sports uh, vibe to it. You know, it's not a bad idea. I can I can see where you're going with this. Like, there's probably a lot more that you have to like really def like you really got to map out in terms of a Cars musical, but. Going towards that direction is not, um, it ain't that bad of an idea. Okay, so that was our number five spot right over here. And now we are going to jump on to number four. And unlike this Ratatouille TikTok musical, we're going to go all the way back at the beginning of the year. Yes, this was actually set during the time when the pandemic wasn't even a thing. The coronavirus was a bit of a concern, but it wasn't something that was on everybody's mind. This was actually once a major deal uh, when this occurred, especially in the animation world, because this was a case where there wasn't just one winner, there was actually several. So coming in at number four on the list, we got the most competitive award season for best 
animated feature. Yes, there have been some very notable things that happen at this year's award season, especially when at the Oscars, the Best Picture winner turned out to be an international movie with Parasite, which if you guys have not seen that, then I highly recommend that you do so because it is actually an amazing feature. I adore that movie. I even got the Blu-ray like right after I saw it. But anyways, the, the biggest shock, however, was the fact that for the Best Animated Feature category, there didn't seem to be just one winner uh, throughout the entire uh, awards. It actually went to a variety of movies, especially when it comes to the big ones. This actually started out with the Golden Globe Awards, where despite the fact that the grand majority of the nominations came from Disney with Frozen 2, The Lion King Remake, and Toy Story 4, the winner actually turned out to be Missing Link, the latest stop-motion animated feature from Laika. That somehow ended up becoming the big winner, and some may say was actually the biggest shock in the Golden Globe Awards because, well, it's not just the fact that Disney didn't win a Golden Globe Award with their movies, especially with Toy Story 4, but it actually went to a stop-motion movie. The first time ever a Golden Glo uh, a stop-motion film actually won a Golden Globe Award. And then, following afterwards, was the Annie Awards, the biggest award ceremony dedicated to animation, in which that winner actually turned out to be Klaus, where it actually won several, not just one. It didn't only win Best Animated Feature, it also won for Best Character Animation, Best uh, Character Design, Best Directing, Best Production Design, Best Storyboarding, and finally, Best Editing. So there was no, there, there were a few other winners as well. Uh, I Lost My Body won a few. And, uh, Fro well, of course, you got Frozen 2 winning one for Josh Gad's performance as Olaf. But the big winner among all of them is hands down Klaus. But then came the Oscars. And when it came to the Oscars, and also with many of the other Critics' Choice Awards, like the Los Angeles Chris Critics' Choice Awards, the New York Critics' Choice Awards, the Chicago Critics' Choice Awards, and many, many more, that one actually went to a completely different movie, where the winner went to Toy Story 4. And that's the big thing that I want to emphasize on number four here, is the fact that we didn't just have one major winner for Best Animated Feature, but we had several, especially spanning across um, the different major award ceremonies like the Golden Globes, the Annies, and the Oscars, where it went to Missing Link, Klaus, and Toy Story 4. Oh, and uh, I almost forgot to mention that when it came to Klaus, it also won for Best Animated Feature at the BAFTA Awards. Now, the reason why I put this one here, and what makes it very significant, is that over the years, what we are more accustomed to is the format of just the one to rule them all. The one animated feature to win everything when it comes to the best animated feature category. And the previous years were definite proof of that, where you would have Coco winning uh, everything for best animated feature, or you would have Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse winning everything. But... This did not happen here. While some people may have expected that maybe Toy Story 4 would win everything, that's not what occurred. Instead, it actually went to three different winners. And I find that there really is this massive beauty when it comes to the three separate winners here. Because these three winners actually represent the three different mediums of animation. First of all, you got Missing Link which is a stop-motion animated feature from Laika, the studio that brought us many great stop-motion films like uh, Coraline, Kubo and the Two Strings, uh, The Box Trolls, and Paranorman. And then you would also have Klaus, which is the uh, first Netflix animated movie, or the first animated movie made by Netflix, which was actually 
uh, done mostly in hand-drawn animation. There are some computer animated elements in there, but its primary medium is actually hand-drawn animation, and it did so in a massively beautiful way. Like, this was a very long-awaited comeback of hand-drawn animation that people have been waiting for since The Princess and the Frog. And then finally, you got Toy Story 4, which debatably was the best computer animated film of uh, 2019. Like, there have been some very notable ones as well, like Frozen 2 and How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, but really the main, but really, like, the one to really top them all was uh, Toy Story 4. And, and honestly, that's what I really like about this, is, is the fact that it really showed the diversity of animation being the big winners here, where we got a win for stop motion, we got a win for uh, hand-drawn, and we got a win for CGI. And honestly, this is going to be a little bit of a controversial opinion here, but I just want to say, I think I actually do, pr I, I, I think I do prefer this format of winners than the one to rule them all. Because I know that a lot of people uh, can often get pretty competitive when it comes to uh, award season. That they have their one favorite animated film and they want to see it win everything. And, and like this is the case with like many other categories as well. But it's especially with animation where they pretty much root for that one movie and they want to see that win everything pretty much like the like the previous years like we saw with coco and spider-man into the spider-verse and a little bit of the same we have seen uh, especially with the oscars where it was a little bit controversial with the decision of toy story 4 mainly because of the fact that a lot of people were really rooting for klaus because if you guys know the cartoon community there is nothing more that they are desperate than seeing mainstream hand hand-drawn animation make a comeback in feature films so but even at that though i will say that I, I just find that it really is beautiful because it's not just one winner but we got several winners and at least like as, as you guys probably know you, you know like in one year there's not just one good movie and everything else is crap I, I, you know, I really do like to see that, like, even the work that has done, ha, that has been done with the other movies that may not be as good as, like, what's said to be the best one can also get awarded as well. That we also see movies like, uh, Missing Link or even Klaus actually getting some wins as well. Uh, and it's not always, like, the same one big winner all the time, you know? Like, honestly, as much as, like, I'm probably in the minority where I believe Toy Story 4 is as good as, like, the three other Toy Story movies. I will say, like, I am happy that Toy Story 4 didn't win everything, everything, as many people probably predicted before. You know, I'm happy that it did manage to get some wins, and I am really happy that it did win the Oscar. I do believe that it definitely earned it. I am glad, however, that Klaus and Missing Link did manage to get some other wins as well, where we don't have to be competitive, and we can actually cheer on uh, for the other people uh, that did receive uh, some awards and some wins as well. So that's one thing that I really am happy about and that we could actually say congratulations to not just one group of winners but to several group of winners as well and that's what I love that that's what I love about this it's really the diver the, the diversity of winners that we do have and that's an extremely rare occurrence uh that we would have in the uh in, in the award season especially for the category of best animated feature and are we going to see this again? Honestly, I highly I, I highly doubt it, actually. Like, even this year, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, Soul would end up becoming the big winner, like the one to rule them all in the best animated feature category. Maybe it will be facing some tough competition with Cartoon Saloon's Wolfwalkers, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like, most of it is just gonna go to Soul and that's it. Uh, but with that said, though, I just want to say, like, I know I said this in the past, but I want to say congratulations to the people that worked on movies such as Missing Link, such as um, uh, Klaus, and uh, to movies like Toy Story 4 on their wins. And hopefully in the future, we could see more of this happening as well, where we don't have one prominent winner, but several prominent winners for the best animated, ca uh, best animated feature category during award season.
Okay, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to ask you all, how do you feel about the list of winners that we got, the several winners that we have received during award season. Do you prefer something like this where we got se that we got more than one winner or do you prefer the format of just one to rule them all? Let me know what you think. Okay, let's see now. Holy shit! <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna write that, I might as well make it dramatic as possible. <laughs> Anyways, I'm now nostalgic for last year's award ceremonies. The fact that there were different winners for each award is a testament to how good the year 2019 was for movies and non-animated movies, even making it to the top uh, in my top 10, which tells you something. I feel it feels so long ago when I was upset that Ad Astra, Hustlers, and Invisible Life were ignored and rooting for Parasite and Knives Out. I want to go back. Oh yeah, trust me dude, I think we all want to go back to the days of like when 2020 was just beginning and like the coronavirus was only just a minor concern. You know, I think we all wish to go back to those days. I certainly, trust me, I certainly do. Anyways, but then again, like we are getting the vaccine soon, so hopefully by 2022 or maybe even 2023, things will go back to that time again. <clears throat> Anyways, um... Wow, a lot of winners of each cat of uh, each award. I did enjoy the movies that won awards, except the only animated movie I haven't seen are Klaus and I Lost My Body. Early 2020 was doing pretty well, uh, except when the coronavirus came and ruined almost all of us and other film companies as well, uh, despite the fact that uh, movies are getting delayed. I just hope that everything in 2021 will be a fine year if everything goes back to normal, including the Oscars, so please... Let the year be okay! <laughs> I mean, I think it's safe to say that we have reached the bottom of the barrel when it comes to, uh, to, uh, the, to 2020, so, uh, I, like, I, I know I've said this a few times before on social media, but to quote one of my favorite songs in Mary Poppins Returns, there's nowhere to go but up. <sighs> okay, uh, let's see now. Uh, oh, oh, someone is asking Wolfwalkers, where can it be streamed? Uh, Apple TV Plus, just saying. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, this is so very true that there is a lot of great movies from 2019. I'm just so glad that the live action Lion King got no awards, but love all the other animation movies of 2019 and 2020. Just hope 2021 brings us, brings up, uh, brings us some really good gems, uh, of a movie. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm hoping so too, man. I think we're all hoping so. Let's see. Uh, honestly, they need uh, the need for mainstream hand-drawn animation to come back from the cartoon community is kind of warranted. Considering that CGI animation has oversaturated the mainstream market, I know we have indie animated films that's keeping us alive, but still. Yeah, but still, though, like, that doesn't... Yeah, like, I know that, they're, like, CGI is pretty much everywhere, but that doesn't necessarily mean there are no bad CGI movies, you know? Like, like as, as long as as long as it can be done very very well, then I mean it is warranted. And again, like really, it's not like it's not the cartoon community that can determine if hand drawn can come back. It's really the whole public in general if they are interested to see a return in hand drawn animation. Maybe we will see a little bit of a comeback thanks to the more experimental side of streaming services like Netflix, but mm, I'm just saying. Uh, let's see now. Um, with Missing Link, Klaus, and Toy Story 4 winning an award each, this was probably the most diverse animation winners we got. Not just because they were three different movies, but also because they represent three different animation styles. Stop motion, 2D, and 3D. It may not happen again, but hey, there isn't anything wrong with wishing. Yeah, that, that is definitely true, especially with the format of like a stop motion winner, a hand-drawn winner, and a CGI winner. Like that is an extremely rare occurrence, and I think you could probably understand why I even included that on the list. All right, I'll go and read one more comment before we jump on to number three. Uh, let's see here. For me personally, I think this was great for all these animated films. This is one of the rare times where several animated films won different awards. For me, I'm most happy uh, Missing Link won for the Golden Globes considering how people are losing interest in stop motion, and it also got overshadowed by Avengers Endgame. 
And yeah, it is very unfortunate because like, especially nowadays, nobody ever talks about Missing Link. I'm sure like the grand majority of people even forgot what Missing Link was. I mean, it's not one of Leica's best, but it is still a very solid movie and I do highly recommend you go check it out. I don't know if it's on Netflix or anything like that, but if you ever get the chance to like find it on DVD or something like that, then I highly recommend it for you to go and get it. Like it really is worth watching. But I will say, once again, congratulations to all the winners during the 2020 award season. And hopefully this diversity uh, for best animated feature will continue uh, to follow suit. Okay. Now moving on to our next story, uh, well, coming into number three on the list, we actually got some anime news. And what's interesting to note about anime is that it was only at the end of the year where they really blew up with some major news. Where um, you might have heard just recently during the holiday season, uh, Demon Slay uh, the Demon Slayer movie actually ended up breaking the record of Spirited Away and has now officially become the highest grossing movie in Japan. So it really set a brand new record. But that's not the thing that I'm going to be talking about. What I am going to be discussing about is something that for many anime fans, they are very much concerned. This was something that happened just recently, a few weeks ago as I am recording this in fact, but it is something that they are a little bit worried on what this means of the future of how they will be consuming their anime. And so coming in at number three on the list, we got Sony buying Crunchyroll. Yes, it is official. A few weeks ago, as I am recording this, Sony has made a deal with AT&T to go and fully purchase the anime business of Crunchyroll for an estimate $1.175 billion, all of which in cash. <laughs> and that's a crazy thing. Like, usually with these deals, especially, like, when they would enter into the billion realm, like, usually there would be some kind of, like, equity, maybe, like, some extra stocks or, or stuff like that, that that would come with the package. But no, all this, $1.175 billion, everything in cash money, all them bills being paid just so they can get Crunchyroll. Now, the big significance with Sony specifically buying Crunchyroll from AT&T is the fact that Sony already owns what is debatably said to be Crunchyroll's biggest competitor in the animation distribution industry, which is Funimation. And if I may read a little bit from my source here on uh, Variety, uh, they did state that when it does come to uh, Funimation, that um, Funimation distributes over 700 anime series representing more than 13,000 hours of content available in 49 different countries. But the big thing about it is that Crunchyroll is actually much larger than um, the much larger than Funimation, at least in terms of the amount of content that they do actually have in the service, and especially when it comes to how many people are subscribed to Crunchyroll, where it says here. Crunchyroll toots more than 3 million subscription vi video on demand subscribers and some 90 million registered users across more than 200 countries and territories as well. Uh, it offers ad supported VOD, mobile games, manga, event merchandise, and distribution. Crunchyroll says it has more than 1,000 titles and over 30,000 episodes, which it claims represents the world's largest anime library and apparently that an that anime library almost grew twice as large because now they are all under sony pictures and right now this is actually a massive concern in the anime community they're all freaking out a little bit because of this thing happening because essentially this is actually the closest that we would see in terms of a monopoly. I know that some may argue that this is a very niche monopoly because this is about international anime distribution that is outside of Japan, 
but still a monopoly nonetheless. Yes, there are other competitors as well that Sony would have to face, and even some that are notably big, like uh, Amazon Prime that would distribute anime, Hulu distributing anime, and even Netflix distributing anime. But the thing with those big companies is that that's not their niche market. That's not what they specialize. They, they, just, uh, they just distribute anime as kind of like a side thing. It's like a, a bonus in their own streaming services. Funimation and Crunchyroll, they specialize in exactly that. It really is to, to really go and emphasize anime distribution. And in that regard, yeah, Sony definitely has the majority of the, uh, of the whole industry. And yeah, they pretty much are close to a monopoly, even more than like what Disney would be doing. Like for anime fans, they feel, you know, they pretty much feel the exact same way as how people would react to when Disney would keep on buying stuff like Fox or Lucasfilm or Marvel and all that kind of stuff but this is actually in a much bigger scale in their little uh, community in their little thing that they are focusing on because now they know for a fact that the grand majority of the animes that they are consuming they are most likely coming from Sony right now. And also, another major factor that they very much are concerned is the fact that now Crunchyroll is in the hands of Sony. And for the anime community, they are not big fans of uh, Sony. And the reason why is because ever since uh, Sony purchased Funimation back in 2017, in which uh, I believe it says here that uh, Sony didn't even pay all that much for Funimation uh, compared to... Uh, compared to uh, Crunchyroll. In fact, uh, they, they have debatably uh, paid almost 10 times less uh, than they did for Crunchyroll, which is said to be an estimate $150 million. And the thing with uh, Sony is that the way that they are handling uh, their animes with Funimation, it's not been, like, they haven't been viewed highly, especially with a lot of allegations of censorships and having, uh, very difficult standards when it comes to, uh, distributing, uh, so certain anime, and even to the point where there are some anime episodes that are not released under Funimation because they don't meet those very specific standards that apparently Sony has, uh, when it comes to distributing anime under Funimation. So we don't, so the big question is, are they going to be doing the same thing with Crunchyroll? Well, unfortunately, uh, that we don't know. Like I said before, as I am recording this, this is something that just recently occurred. It's something that it hasn't even been a month ago that it happened. It was only just a few weeks that Sony officially went and made the deal with AT&T. So there's no guarantee regarding um, if this is actually the case that Crunchyroll uh, will be handled the same way as Sony is currently handling Funimation and they would, they would also include those very specific standards of um, handling the animes. But, th but then there is the bigger question... How are people going to be consuming uh, their animes from now on? Because now, like, you got two of the biggest anime distributors that are now under one umbrella with Sony Pictures. How, what are they going to do now? Because technically, they do own two major uh, distributors and two major anime-specific streaming services. Uh, is Sony Picture... Is, is, well, I, I don't know why. I, I'm too used to saying Sony Pictures. I, sh I should just say Sony in this case. I don't know if this is really something that is specifically with Sony Pictures. But according to this, it does look like Sony Pictures does have... Uh, yeah, Sony Pictures does have a bit of a hand in this, so, like, technically it's not that inaccurate to say Sony Pictures. Uh, but the thing is, is that we don't know what Sony is going to do with both Crunchyroll and uh, Funimation. Some people speculate that maybe they will go and combine those two together in order to make one massive anime-specific streaming service. Uh, some think that maybe they're going to keep them separate. And when it comes to the distribution... Uh, are they gonna go, like, which one, like, which ones are they gonna go in terms of, like, 
who to distribute, like which animes would they want to go and distribute to Just Funimation, and which animes would they want to just distribute in Crunchyroll, and which ones that maybe they want to do both. Like there is a lot of questions that do come with this deal right here. But the reason why I am putting this at number three is that even though we don't have the questions already, we know that what just happened here, that this massive bombshell is that this will massively impact how people in the West are going to be consuming their animes. And at that point, we don't know if this is something that they will actually enjoy or if it's something that they might not like and it might really ruin the experience for them, especially when they're not in good terms with Sony with the way that they have been handling uh, the Funimation animes. So for now, it really is just a massive wait and see kind of thing. But when it comes to these uh, massive acquisitions that are worth that that really cross the billion dollar mark, the, like it is still something that is massively worth talking about uh, right over here, and it definitely is worth being one of the biggest animation news of the year. So that's why I would go and put this on the list here because uh, we don't know what might be happening, but we know something big is going to come in 2021. And I understand that for many anime fans, they do feel a little bit anxious, but ultimately we'll just have to wait and see with how uh, Crunchyroll and Funimation will be. It, it's all, it, it all depends on what Sony's big plan with those anime companies uh, that they, what, what are they going to do when moving forward? We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, so with that said now, let us now go on to the chat wall. And I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about Sony buying Crunchyroll and now owning both Crunchyroll and Funimation? Do you guys have any concerns? Do you think this is actually a good idea? Let me know what you all think on this. Uh, let's see now. Uh, as mentioned in your past coverage of the news, my concerns lie in the potential increase of censorship of several mature anime uh, to appease certain markets. I know censorship is nothing new in this day and age, uh, but there is a legit worry of how Sony could dumb down so much anime down that it would give four kids a run for their money. Again... That really depends. We don't know. Like, we, we know they're all, like, technically we know that, like, some some of that has been happening with Funimation, but would that also mean that they're going to do the same thing with Crunchyroll? That I don't know. That, it, it all depends on what Sony wants to do with it. It all depends if Sony has a massive say. Like, maybe they'll keep it separate, like how Disney is keeping uh, companies like uh, Disney Animation, Pixar, and Blue Sky separate. Or how Universal is keeping Illumination and DreamWorks Animation separate. That, like, that, there is that possibility as well. But um, this, however, I really don't know. It's really, again, it's all up to Sony with what they want to do. But I, again, I do understand the concerns. Uh, let's see what we have here. When I first heard of this, my first thought was, how stupid do you have to be to sell your anime division when anime is booming? My big takeaway was how much of a dumb decision this was in terms of businesses for AT&T. I guess this is how Sony can enter the streaming market without getting annihilated uh, by focusing on a niche thing and sell their other shows uh, to their competition like Netflix and HBO Max. Well, one thing that I just want to say right now is that um, it's not really Sony really wanting to buy Crunchyroll. It was actually AT and T really wanting to uh, really wanting to sell Crunchyroll. And I mean, like, yeah, it may seem absolutely stupid, but the thing is, is that it's the pandemic, and as you could probably imagine, ooh, excuse me, <clears throat> as you could probably imagine. The pandemic really hit AT&T very hard on numerous of different factors. So maybe sell, maybe AT&T selling Crunchyroll is just a bit of a desperate need for money and maybe something that it has been going well for them uh, with owning Crunchyroll so they would just hand it over to someone else. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's just really AT&T was just like, yeah. Like, even though right now the anime industry is actually going pretty well right now, it's just that AT&T is just really desperate for the money. And yeah, they might need a billion dollars to help keep themselves uh, stable for now. Uh, let's see, what else do we got here? Uh, let's see. Ah. Um, 
Well, uh, while I'm not a big anime fan, I really don't think this was a good idea, considering how they already have Funimation, and also, uh, I am already predicting that Sony could potentially got a, get a lot of backlash for Sony buying Crunchyroll. Also, I wish people would stop antagonizing Disney for having a monopoly and not point their finger at Sony. Or do you mean now point their finger? But anyways, the the thing is, is that, yeah, like th that that's one of the biggest backlashes uh, that people are already giving to this news is that this is the fact that this is a massive monopoly. I mean, let's think about it. If I could go and ask you, like maybe some of you are not major anime fans, but other than Crunchyroll and Funimation, what other major uh, anime distributors uh, that go worldwide, that go outside of Japan, are there out there? Like, I know some people, maybe they would go and point out to stuff like maybe Sentai film, uh, sen like Sentai and stuff like that. But then again, there it, let, let's face facts. There are none of them that are at the same scale as either Funimation or Crunchyroll. And that is the real factor of why this really does seem, uh, oh, okay, yeah, do point the finger at Sony. The, the, the person did specify. Uh, like, and that's really the big thing to really specify uh, about all this. This is why people really do feel like it's a massive uh, monopoly because the two biggest ones are now pretty much blended together under one company. And I see that people are do stating that uh, there is G Kids as well. But uh, honestly, I don't think I would necessarily count G Kids because they don't specify in, uh, they, they don't just specify in anime. I mean, yes, they do distribute a lot of anime and they are currently, uh, the, inter the, the current North American distributors of, uh, the Studio Ghibli films, but they're not just about anime. Like, they, they are mainly about independent an animated films. Like, they also distribute, uh, the movies from, like, uh, uh, like Cartoon Saloon or uh, from Brazil with uh, Boy in the World and they would distribute other movies like uh, My Life as a Zucchini, Ernest as Celestine and, uh, and and many many more. I'm just looking at my collection just to find some examples but you guys get what I mean. I, I, like, I don't count G-Kids as uh, the same type of company as Crunchyroll or Funimation because they don't just specify into just anime like they're not like they are a little bit more broad than just that niche market uh let's see uh, i'll go and read one more news before we jump into the next story right over here uh let's see uh who else do we got uh okay right over here now uh, my brother, my brothers and sister are huge anime fans, but I think they'll question about the fact that the Jumbotron market at Sony own both Funimation and Crunchyroll. I will also predict that YouTube channels, other files might get a reference, uh, to that whole Sony Crunchyroll deal, but as of 2021, they seem to be inactive, sadly. Yeah, that's the big thing about all this, is that... We don't know how it's going to be a big deal. We don't know how it's going to impact both Crunchyroll and Funimation. But we know that this whole buyout is a big deal. And this is why I put this on the list. Maybe some people might say it's a bit premature to immediately put it in because it might not be as big of a deal as it is. But when when, when a company would go and spend over a billion dollars to go and buy uh, an entire business like Crunchyroll, that is a big deal within itself. All right, so now coming in at number two, that's when we are starting to go into the big stories. And this is going to be the ones that will really enter the realm of the pandemic. Now, I just want to state right now that originally, uh, throughout the year, I was originally thinking about uh, putting in the whole coronavirus as the number one animation news story of the year. But then again, I decided to pull back from it because that would be cheating. And instead, for the top two stories I have over here, they are actually going to be more focused onto uh, the impact that the pandemic had onto the film industry. And so, uh, for my number two spot, what I'm going to do is going to be something that is massive, and that will be something I would like to call the Mass Movie Exodus. Now, what I have here 
is actually a, a Wikipedia article or, or a Wikipedia page of the list of films impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, one thing I will state right now is that technically, yes, we all know for a fact that it is very common for a movie to go and get delayed or to switch up release dates. Like, that happens all the time. And, like, even, like, before the coronavirus was a thing, everybody, like, we, we would often see that all the time where studios would just switch things up when it comes to release dates because sometimes productions would have, like, one problem or another. Or, or they want to try to settle things out with, like, what would be released and what would be put on hold and stuff like that. However, none of, the, none of those times have ever been in the same scale as what happened throughout 2020, where it really did blow up to the point where the grand majority of movies that were originally scheduled for 2020 ended up getting either delayed, either being released at home, or released exclusively at home, in fact, or tried to do a little bit of both of releasing it in theaters or releasing it, uh, like, a little bit of both of releasing it in theaters and releasing it on video on demand. Like, they're trying out so many different ideas. And on this list here, like, like as you can tell with this Wikipedia page, like, they got a massive list of all the movies that have been released both uh, uh, in theaters and on uh, video on demand, or at least, like, some of the upcoming ones as well. Uh, and then, um, like, you got the international theaters that have been, uh, yeah, the, yeah, like, in terms of the international theaters that uh, they would be affected by that as well. Uh, and then, like, you, well, like, honestly, I do find this pretty hilarious, is that, uh, there is actually a very tiny list that they also included of, uh, movies that have been pushed forward because of the pandemic, where you got, uh, Crude's The New Age that had been, uh, moved up by a month, you got Hamilton that got massively pushed up from October of 2021 to July of 2020, uh, then you got Hotel Transylvania 4 that moved uh, from Christmas 2021, uh, yeah, from like Christmas 2021 to August 6th of 2021. And then finally we got We Can Be Heroes that got moved up uh, by a week that was supposed to be released on New Year's but instead got released on Christmas. But then get ready for this. Look at the list of all the delays. These are all the movies you see here that got delayed. Delay after delay after delay after delay after delay. All caused by the pandemic. And even on top of that, we even have a list of just movies that flat out that, that just flat out canceled their theatrical release and decided to move straight onto uh, video on demand services or even just uh, directly onto uh, streaming services as well. So like we got stuff like uh, Artemis Fowl that just decided to jump onto uh, Disney Plus exclusively. You got Songbird that just got released on video on demand exclusively. Uh, Steven Universe the movie canceled its plans to be released in theaters and just be released on uh, uh, Cartoon Network exclusively and just a, a few others. And then it even got a list of all the productions that got delayed uh, that either got completely suspended or it got massively delayed. And as you could tell, we got just a seriously massive list over here, just like movie after movie. And you could definitely tell the massive impact that it has had on the industry and you you could definitely tell that when it comes to the movie industry they definitely got hit the hardest and unfortunately they pretty much had no choice because technically the market in which they could go and release their movies it got closed down or at least the grand majority of it got closed and when it's a pandemic, people are not in the mood to go and check out a movie. I remember there was a Variety article once that actually did do a, a little bit of a survey, or they reported that there was a survey that was conducted, and that the grand majority of people, like 70% of them, are not interested in going to see a movie during the pandemic. And even almost half of the, like, even almost half the uh, of people in general like, they just, they're not ready to go into a movie theater for, like, the next six months. And that's it. Like, they're pretty much restricting themselves from ever seeing a movie 
on the big screen, which is why we are even seeing movie studios uh, going out of their way to really improvise and even going against the wishes of movie theaters by putting them either on video on demand or on streaming services, uh, which is why we even end up with many controversial decisions like Disney moving their movies uh, to Disney Plus, like the Mulan remake or Soul, or especially the very controversial decision of Warner Brothers announcing that for all their 2021 movies, including the big ones like Matrix 4, Tom and Jerry, um, uh, well, they, they also did it with Wonder Woman 1984, uh, Matrix 4, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong, In the Heights, and many, many more, all of them, instead, uh, instead of just being released in theaters, they would do a combination of both, being released in theaters and on HBO Max, which not only upset movie theaters, but also uh, upset a lot of uh, a different, a, a lot of filmmakers as well, especially for those people uh, that have made those movies, like uh, Denis Villeneuve, for example, uh, that that he was ready with uh, his Dune movie, but now the fact that it's going to be released both in theaters and HBO Max, he is massively upset because his movie just ended up being shafted on a streaming service where they were not going to see it at home, and instead just on either like on their phones or just on their computer screens or maybe on TV or something like that. Not in the full experience that he wishes people could experience it. And this is just regarding like video on demand. And honestly, like I don't blame uh, movie studios to go and actually do that, to either massively delay it or even uh, like put it on video on demand, which honestly, I wouldn't be surprised that in 2021, we are going to see more of that, that we are going to see more studios, uh, actually give in and actually start distributing their major movies onto either streaming services like Netflix, HBO Max, and Disney Plus, or even just on video on demand in general. And that's mainly because during a pandemic, movie theaters are pretty much toast. Like, they're not really that good. But because the thing is, they're really just a luxury. They are a massive non-essential. And worse than being a luxury and an essential, it's pretty much a place where it feels way too easy for the virus to just go and easily spread. Because it's literally just entering into a room where a bunch of random strangers can huddle together, like, seat after seat, and all they do is just sit there and watch a movie. And sometimes, like, they would do heavy breathing. They would go and, like, op like open their mouth so that they can consume popcorn or drinks. Or, like, especially if they would watch a comedy, sometimes, like, they would go and let out their emotions. Like, in a drama, they would cry their eyes out. Or in a comedy, they would just be laughing. It makes it way too easy for the virus to spread. And it really is a place where... It's very unappealing when it comes to uh, a pandemic. It feels like it's more ideal for the virus more so than it is for the luxury of people. So that's why many people are not even that interested in going there anyways. And because they are labeled as a non-essential service, that's why they have to be kept closed down in certain areas. Like uh, where I am now in Quebec, uh, I'll say this right now. As I am recording this, we are in a full, full lockdown. And when I say full lockdown... I mean, down to the point where, like, we're like we're not allowed to have any form of gatherings, like during the holiday season, and we're not, and like, uh, like pretty much, um, when it comes to stores and services, all of them are closed except for the ex uh, except for the essential ones, and even when it comes to places like Walmart, they would go and completely close down any of their non-essential aisles so that only the essential places are open like you can only go to Walmart to buy groceries and stuff like that but when it comes to the electronic section the toy section the seasonal section or anything like that those are closed you cannot go and get anything I will say right now that it is for sure we did not have a boxing day this year so with that said of course cinemas are closed so nobody can go and watch any of the big movies that have come out like nobody can go and experience Wonder Woman 1984 on the big screen because there are no big screens to go and check it out on so we pretty much have no choice but to watch it at home but I will say also even if movie theaters are open there is still one other massive problem for movie studios 
And that is, they're still not really that profitable due to the fact that movie theaters still have to go by law and follow the guidelines, where they would have to go and spend more of their revenue, they would spend more of their budget onto cleaning products to make sure that everything is more clean than usual to be more serious and to spend their money on masks and hand sanitizers. And on top of that, like probably what is the most damaging is that a lot of them have a limited capacity. They can't literally fill the theaters with people anymore. They have to restrict that to either like maybe 75% or even just half of that, like in 50% or maybe even less, which as a result, it makes movie theaters less profitable. So regardless of what Christopher Nolan says, the more economic choice, unfortunately, is to go and release those movies onto either video on demand or put them on streaming services and hope that the revenue that they would make on either streaming services or from the rentals on video on demand that they could bring in the profits instead and for some of them it actually did work out well like uh, just recently with uh, Pixar Soul for example that has actually been going very well for Disney Plus so much so that apparently it has been reported that Soul is actually doing way better than Wonder Woman 1984 on HBO Max so it's pretty much at the point that this is the best that they could do now. And also, I just want to say that on top of that, this doesn't just affect the movies of 2020 moving to 2021. This also has a very serious domino effect where we would see one movie after another where they would go and get re where they would go and get delayed and that means the other one has to be delayed because considering that we are currently in a movie culture that focuses more on franchises, they can't just put one movie on the side. They have to put the rest of them as well. Like Marvel for example, they had to to delay their entire schedule down to the point that it even affected their movies that go all the way up to 2023 or maybe even beyond where it's not just they could just delay Black Widow and that's it they delay Black Widow meaning that they also have to delay the Eternals which means they also have to delay the third Spider-Man movie which means they also have to delay Doctor Strange which means they also have to go and delay so uh, like they, they also have to delay Shang-Chi and so on and so forth. You get where I'm going with this. In fact, um, just recently during the holiday season, we actually just saw an example of that where DreamWorks Animation has actually announced uh, the Boss Baby family business where that movie was supposed to be released this March. But unfortunately, they had to go and delay that to September in which that release date originally scheduled for the bad guys ended up being moved to 2022. And, and uh, speaking, of, speaking of those films, by the way, this also really affected animation as well. Even though a lot of people would report that animation is still thriving and surviving where animators can comfortably work at home and still produce their animated series and animated shows, when it comes to releasing them, that's an entirely different story. Now, the, the thing is, is that even uh, a bunch of animated films did get uh, did get affected and they had to be heavily pushed back as well. We saw Soul, for example, that was supposed to be released in June, but it had to be pushed back by about half a year where now it got released on Christmas. And then you also got Raya and the Last Dragon, where that was supposed to be released in November during American Thanksgiving, but that has been pushed back to March. And then on top of that, you would also go and get um, Minions, The Rise of Gru. That was supposed to be released in July of 2020. It was supposed to be out at the same time as Despicable Me's 10th anniversary. But unfortunately, that's not going to work out. And they had to go and delay that by literally a full year to July of 2021, which caused a domino effect, which also resulted in Sing 2 to be, dele to be delayed to Christmas uh, of 2021. And then on top of that, you also got Sony Animations Connected, where they were promising that they were going to release it soon, but as of right now, 
We don't know what the fridge is happening. Do you guys know? I just want to I just want to say I just want to ask. Do you guys know what what's even happening with Soul? Because so far the last I heard is that apparently Sony Sony was prepared to go and release it sometime at the end of 2020, but that has yet to happen. Like I have heard reports like I think Phil Lord stated that the movie is complete. They wrapped up production and the movie is ready to go. So all Sony has to do is just uh release it. But now we have no idea what's going on. And we don't even know if Sony is going to be releasing Soul. So we have no idea what's ha what, what's even happening with that film. We have no idea with what, what Sony is going to do with that movie in general. But you do see why this is my number two on the list. is because this is the biggest impact that the pandemic has done uh, towards uh, the movie industry. And that many of these films either had to be severely delayed or they would have no choice but to go directly at home. So that that's pretty much one thing that is really going to be affecting not just uh, like it won't just affect 2020, but it's going to affect us for many years to come, like following following us in 2021, 2022, 2023 and even more. So that's one thing I want to talk about is the big delay that did occur. So, with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I want to go and ask you all, how do you feel about all these massive movie delays? Uh, were there some that you were disappointed that you didn't get in 2020? Uh, were there some that, like, uh, that you were hoping for to get released soon? Do you understand what's going on? Do you prefer that movies stay in theaters, or that they would move, uh, to video on demand and streaming services? Let me know what you all think. Okay. <clears throat> 2020 was the year Hollywood changed forever. For me personally, uh, this is for the best. It really is just for the safety of everyone. And I would have to put the blame on Tenet for being released and not doing well. Also, this might be controversial, but I think Disney should consider putting Black Widow onto Disney Plus so they can keep up with the times to compete with HBO Max, considering that they have been doing well with Wonder Woman 1984, so they won't have to delay Black Widow again. I'm just going to state this right now. Well, I, I've already stated that technically Soul actually, I heard reports that Soul did better than Wonder Woman 1984. So Disney doesn't have to worry about that. But one thing that I could say right now is that I don't think Disney is going to delay Black Widow. I mean, they've already delayed it by a full year, but I think that's going to be the last delay. And if things don't get better by May, then I'm just going to say right now, don't be surprised if we are going to see Black Widow be released on Disney Plus, or they would go and adopt a similar format to what uh, HBO Max is doing, and what Disney is even oh excuse me, <clears throat> and what Disney is doing with Raya and the Last Dragon, where they're going to release Black Widow both on Disney Plus and on HBO Max. I think this is going to be something that will actually happen, so just keep an eye out on on that. Like honestly. We're, we're not going to see any more delays when it comes to the Marvel movies. Like, Disney is at their ropes and, like, they can't just keep delaying the crap forever just because of the pandemic, man. They, they got to learn that, yeah, even they have to let go of movies, uh, of movie theaters for, uh, at some point. Okay, let's see now. Boy, it was 2020 chaotic like the ad of the Lord of Darkness from the 1985 movie Legend and a woman named, well, 2020. Uh, let's just hope that uh, movies in general don't get delayed even more because this is getting tiresome. Well, at least the Xbox Series XS and the PS5 have been released instead of getting delayed. Uh, but with the, uh, but will this affect not, on, not only movies but video game companies as well? Uh, if I if it already does though, uh, plus I already looked up before. Uh, let me get get to the point of this. Curse you, COVID nineteen. Well, I mean, I guess the thing is, is that. When it comes to the productions of uh, video games, they're really not all that different from animation. So I don't think they're really affected as much as uh, as like live action productions and stuff like that. So at least that's me. Like I, I could be wrong, of course, but yeah, I, I guess um, I think video games are going to be fine, especially if they are able to release uh, the Xbox Series and the PS5 during the holiday season just fine. So. Honestly, I, I think this really is something that uh, 
we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see with what more they could do. But yeah, <laughs> I, I can understand your sentiments with uh, COVID so far. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, this sure was a year of delays with a one, once in a century pandemic. The ones I, I was the most disappointed with the delays are the animated films that have been pushed both uh, to 2021, 2022, and beyond. I would have to applaud the movie studios for doing the best thing during a worst case scenario of closing down theaters. Though I do expect uh, mo more delays in the future, such as 20th Century's Bob's Burgers the Movie and Illumination's Super Mario Brothers film. Yeah, there is a very high uh, possibility of that. And may I add also that when it comes to movie theaters, like, yeah, I, I think, honestly, they have no choice but to do the right thing because if they don't, then they would end up in some serious trouble. They would be facing some serious PR nightmare where the their nightmare scenario would be that apparently a COVID outbreak occurred because a bunch of people decided to go to the movie theater and watch their movie in particular. Or another case would be that they don't want to be like Tenet and they don't want their movie to be responsible to end up becoming a massive box office bomb and encourage other movie studios to just release their film either on video on demand or streaming services so there is a little bit of a combination that yes they have done the right thing but their intentions is to make sure that they really do not mess up <laughs> okay well, let's see what else we got here according to the market watch 70 percent of people would rather watch movies at home even if theaters reopen survey uh, sur uh survey and really want to see uh, the big blockbuster worth going to a movie theater and for art house movies and indie movies are better at home for the price and not worth seeing at a high price for a bigger sp a bigger screen. So yeah, that that I, I think that's pretty much the big thing right now is that if you want to go and watch a movie on the big screen, the best thing you could do for yourself is just literally buy a big screen to go watch your movies on. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, it really has been frightful to see how many thea uh, theatrical movies have either had to delay their releases or skip it and go straight to streaming. I feel bad for all those who put their blood, sweat, and tears into making their movies and those wrestled with all the financial side uh, of the business only to ultimately not even have a chance uh, to make their budgets. Uh, I mean, yeah, like, uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, they would, like, you know, it, like all those efforts would be wasted if they don't get released on the big screen. It's just that the movies are entering into a market that people understand a little less than the traditional box office format. You know, like uh, Soul or Wonder Woman 1984. Yeah, like they don't have the luxury of fully indulging uh, the box office results, but that doesn't mean those are failures. If they are doing very well for their respective streaming services, then they could be considered a hit in their own right. So that's just something I want to go and uh, emphasize on, on that statement. Uh, let's see, I'll go and read one more before we get into the big number one here, because trust me, I I'm sure you guys are going to hype up for this. <clears throat> Although this is problematic for many movie companies and for everyone, we need to simply wear a mask so the film delays could stop. I'm a little disappointed that I didn't get to see a lot of movies in 2020 that got delayed like Jungle Cruise and Raya. Let's just hope uh, the pandemic would be more kinder to the film industry this year. Yeah, let, let's just hope. And I mean, like, it already helps a little bit that we do have uh, the vaccine coming. But uh, for now, though, I think you pretty much sa said it best. If you want to go back to the big screen, if you want to go back to make sure that movie theaters can be up and running again so that you can watch movies on the big screen again, wear a mask. And also follow the additional CDC guidelines. Wash your hands, practice social distancing, and hold anti-maskers accountable and treat them like criminals for killing hundreds of thousands of people, or millions of people in this case. And so we have finally come to number one, the biggest animation news story of 2020. And you know, the funny thing is, is that when it comes to this one in particular, this really is more animation centric. This isn't something that is broad like this one over here, but I will say that when it comes to our number one, this is actually the cause to the main, or like one of the main causes 
to the reason why we are seeing this mass exodus of movies stepping away from the big screen and in embracing more video on demand and home the uh, home theaters, but video on demand and also streaming services to go and premiere their movies. And so people with number one, what I got here is going to be a little piece that I would like to call Trolls Home Tour. Yes, this is actually all related to the movie known as Trolls World Tour. Now, I'm sure nobody would ever expect that when it comes to Trolls World Tour, this would end up becoming the most talked about movie of the year. Not just the most talked about animated film, but the most talked about movie in general. And not necessarily for the reasons that you may think, especially when it comes to... Um, especially when it comes to the impact that it had. And by the way, you guys can still uh, see me, right? You you guys can still talk. I just want to double check. Uh, okay, we're still... Uh we're still live, right? Like we still got the uh, connection going. Just want to just want to double check because I just noticed my computer did a, a little bit of a hiccup and uh, the chat kind of uh, disappeared a little bit. So I just want to know: Are we all okay? Uh, I know I know the recording is still good, so I just want to double check. I don't know. Uh, hopefully you guys are fine. But anyways, um, okay. Well, once it is getting back, uh, let me get back to what I was stating. Yes. Okay. So when it comes to Trolls World Tour. Uh, this ended up becoming definitely the most impactful film that occurred during the pandemic. And the reason why is because back in the beginning of the pandemic, this was actually the first one to say, screw the movie theaters and just go straight home. Like they, they basically pulled off uh, an Eric Cartman in this case, trying to go and say, screw you, screw you movie theaters, I'm a going home. And at that point... With the movie theaters right now, uh, they decided that they would just skip them entirely and they would just go straight to video on demand instead of delaying their April release. And when they did go and release their movies on video on demand, even though that there have been a few movie theaters that are still open and if they are open, they would go and release them, that, that would be perfectly fine. But in this case over here, when they would go and release a movie uh, on the big screen, when they would go and release their uh, feature film on uh, video on demand, actually, it actually turned out to be a massive box office hit. Oh, okay, I see that the, uh, okay, sorry, I, I just saw the chat wall is still alive and well. Maybe it's just on my end, it's just going a little bit weird, but okay. So at least things are going fine so far. But anyways, yes, going back to what I was talking about, yes, Twirls World Tour actually end up uh, working pretty well, actually, uh, when it comes to its uh, home release, where apparently it says here on Deadline that on its uh, first 19 days, it ended up receiving nine, uh, $95 million in rental fees, in which they charge $20 for a 48 hour rental fee. And at that point it did turn out to be a massive hit. And they have started to go and and at that point they started to consider maybe they would go and do that with some some more of their movies, maybe not their major ones, but maybe they would continue forward maybe with uh, The King of Staten Island, for example, that they would try to do the same thing, where they would release it both in theaters and directly on video on demand on the same day. And at that point, uh, they just, uh, movie theaters, they exploded. They ended up becoming furious towards uh, uh, Universal and their decision of what they have done with uh, Trolls World Tour. Down to the point where they got so upset that they, they even had a moment where they decided to go and completely ban any and all Universal movies from premiering in their movie theaters. And this included places such as um, uh, Cineworld, the people who own Regal Cinemas, uh, AMC, and a few others as well. However, straight afterwards, Universal would go and approach, um, they, they would go and approach uh, you know, the, these uh, movie theaters, and they would immediately go and try to make a deal with them. 
they would try to go and discuss and uh, see if they could actually make a deal by stating that, hey, maybe, hold on a sec, I'm sorry if I feel distracted, but I, I feel like something is off here. Are, are, are you are you sure you guys are, uh, are you sure you guys are connected? I just want to double check on my side, like, I, I want to make sure, okay, it's not my internet that suddenly went kaput or anything like that, I don't know, I, for me, I'm just experiencing something a little bit strange, actually, it's just because, like, for some reason, it seems a little bit, like, in the down low, uh, when it comes to, uh, Twitch. Okay, but anyways, um, yes, as I was saying, anyways, I'll stop being distracted, I'm sorry about that, folks. But yes, when it comes to, uh, Universal, they decided afterwards that they would go and make a deal with movie theaters that they want to try to go and really decrease, uh, the amount of time that... Uh, their movies would have between releasing it exclusively in theaters and then distributing it at home, like on video on demand. Beforehand, the gap was actually pretty massive, spanning to like two to three months. But then, immediately afterwards, what actually happened is that um, Universal decided to go and shrink that to around 17 to 18 days, or the equivalent of three weekends in total. And after those three weekends, uh, they would go and be allowed to release uh, their movies on video on demand, considering that uh, three weekend, the first three weekends is usually when you would see uh, the movie, you, you would see the grand majority of the, the box office results for a movie there, and to ultimately determine if a movie can be a major box office hit or a major box office flop. So that's the major reason uh, why, so yeah, the, basically, following afterward, oh yeah, actually, to add on to that, Following afterwards, of course, that's when you would go and actually witness uh, some other studios actually started to take a little bit of influence as well, where they would go and um, start things off with, uh, uh, let, let's see here, yeah, they, they would actually go and be uh, a, a little bit more influenced with what Trolls World Tour has done. Warner Brothers decided to go and do the same thing with Scoob, in which they actually did get some uh, pretty good results. And then, of course, we saw Disney doing a bit of the same thing, where they would release their movies on Disney+, Plus, like the Mulan remake and uh, Soul as well. And then, of course, another major influence, uh, as already mentioned, uh, there was also Tenet, where they decided to just skip the video-on-demand stuff and just release the movie on the big screen like uh, nothing is happening, like if there was no pandemic. And from there, uh, it turned out to be a massive box office flop, and that's when movie theaters decided that the Trolls World Tour format seems more commercially viable than the Tenet format. And that's why nowadays we do see more movie studios uh, encouraging uh, putting their feature films onto their streaming services and on video on demand more so than on a big screen, especially when the pandemic is larger than ever. So, the big reason why I am putting this at number one really is the fact that this has been all caused by this one animated film. That really the big reason is because of Trolls World Tour. And when it came to uh, Trolls World Tour, the, the big question is, why this one in particular? That, that, that really does seem to be uh, the big question here. Why is it that it's Trolls World Tour really get it, that 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 this one seems to be the the movie of choice to really cause all this and not any other movie that was scheduled to come out uh sometime in uh 2020 or something like that so why is the trolls world tour specifically now i did actually think about this and i did hypothesize that there is one of two choices actually uh, there is, well, not one of two choices, but um, I hypothesize two different theories as to why specifically uh, it was Trolls World Tour that made this uh, history-changing move. Number one is because it is a family film. When it comes to Trolls World Tour, um, considering that it is a family movie, and especially when it was during the start of the pandemic when it really began to fully hit uh, North America very hard, 
that was pretty much the time where it was perfect for not just uh, regular moviegoers, but for families especially to really take advantage of this moment. Yes, I know renting a movie for $20 may seem like a lot for an individual. But for families, however, that was a major bargain for them. Because technically, oh dear god, suddenly, what the, uh, wait, son, sorry about that. What's going on with Twitch? Suddenly, it, it just feels like it's disappearing and the connection seems to be difficult. Do, do I still have internet? I just want to double check. Like, you guys can still hear me. Can you guys still see me? And like... Everything seems to be okay on my end, but I don't know why it's having such a hard time to just really to, to get this going. I don't, I don't know what's even happening. Like, I, I could still stream, right? You guys can still hear me. You guys can still see me. I still got internet. Everything seems okay on my end. I, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird seeing that it's bugging out and, like, the, the chat wall seems to be completely empty. I, I don't know. I just... I, I don't know, I just feel like this is suddenly bizarre for Twitch to act up like this. I, I don't know, I, I apologize for like these interruptions and for these delays, but man, this is this is just weird. I don't know, maybe maybe it's something on Twitch's end or something like that, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Our, 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 actually, let me just double check real quick uh, if there are people communicating with me through Twitter or something like that. I uh, just want to see something. No, everything seems fine over here. It's just, yeah, this, it seems like, uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah, okay, something is wrong with Twitter. Something is really acting up in a strange way. Yeah, sorry, this channel is unavailable. What do you mean, man? Yeah, this, this something is really off. I, I don't know. I, again, I apologize for this, but, uh, something is not right. Something is, uh, absolutely not right here. Anyways, um, back to what I was talking about. Yes, okay, so I'll, I'll do the best I can to, to keep this show going. But yes, uh, apparently when it comes to uh, Trolls World Tour, um, now I did hypothesize two theories, and one of them is the fact that it is a family film, and that for families they can massively bargain on having just $20, where they don't have to go to the movie theaters, and they could just buy, like, a ticket for each individual person, like, for the mom, for the dad, or for the mom and the mom, and for the dad and the dad, and then, like, you also got, the like, a kid or two and stuff like that. They could just go and buy $20 for the whole family, and they could enjoy it for as many times as they want during that four, that 48-hour span. So that's a major deal for them that they could really take advantage, which is why it's very much appealing to put up a family film instead of something that would be more mature. But that doesn't fully answer the question about why Trolls World Tour specifically. Why is it specifically that one in particular? Well, to be very honest, the thing is, I understand the idea about maybe putting something like... Uh, uh, like Fast and Furious 9 that was supposed to come out this year and around the same time as uh, Trolls World Tour, I believe. Like, technically some people would say it would make more sense because that would become a more viral and massive hit and more profitable for Universal than something like Trolls World Tour. But that's the thing, though, is that they don't want to risk a major movie where they know they can make billions of dollars on the big screen. With Trolls World Tour, it's not that big of a risk. And the reason why I say that is because when you do look at Trolls World Tour, you have to think back of the movies in 2019, specifically the animated films. Now, there have been a few exceptions that did become successful, like uh, Frozen 2, of course, Toy Story 4, and How to Train Your Dragon the Hidden World. But when it comes to all the others, they were flops. They were bombs. They barely made much money. In fact, take a look at the sequels, especially. Stuff like The Lego Movie 2, the second part, The Angry Birds Movie 2, The Secret Life of Pets 2. All of those movies ended up making less than half of what the original has done. And it even got so bad to the point that movies like Lego Movie 2 ended up becoming a box office bomb. And I'm just going to go and state this right now. That if it were not for the pandemic... That if things were going as normal as possible, like if nothing had changed, then I can guarantee you that Trolls World Tour 
would have been a box office bomb at the box office. Or, yeah, it, it, would, it would have been a box office bomb. It wouldn't have made much money. People would not have much interest anyways. I mean, like, technically, a part of the major success of the first Trolls movie came from the fact that it had a major number one hit song with Can't Stop the Music, but with Trolls World Tour, there was none of that. There is no sequel to Can't Stop the Music. So from there, the people wouldn't really be as interested in this as much as they would with the other Trolls movies. So maybe I, w I could be wrong, but I feel like Trolls World Tour would be no different to what happened with Lego Movie 2 or Angry Birds Movie 2 or Secret Life of Pets 2. It would have it would have been a flop. It would have made so much less money that, or a lot less money than the first Trolls movie. And that's why it wasn't much of a risk for them to sacrifice Trolls World Tour for that film to take the jump. And because of all this, it ended up resulting in Trolls World Tour to become a history changing movie. It's because of this film who decided the first to say, screw the movie theaters and to just immediately go onto video on demand immediately. And while it did get a bunch of backlash, it did set the idea that it's probably for the best to move forward without movie theaters during the pandemic. And I know it may seem weird that it's this film in particular, you know, it's going to be a little bit like Chicken Little per se, where yeah, it's weird to say that Chicken Little is a history making feature, but those are the facts. Disney's Chicken Little is definitely going to be in the movie in the movie history books forever because of the fact that it was actually released uh it was actually the first ever movie to be released in digital 3D. And with Trolls World Tour, with the impact that it's going that it made, yeah, it's going to be in the history books forever. People will bring ba bring up Trolls World Tour not because of the movie itself, but because of what it has done. And it is from there that we're going to see a major impact. Like we're going to see this movie be mentioned again and again in history with the way that it's because of Trolls World Tour that affected uh, film distribution or, or changed film distribution forever. And uh, yeah, I don't have a chat wall for some reason. And that's because for some, like, I don't know if this is a bug with Twitch or something that it killed off the chat wall or I don't know why. Like what happened to this interaction? Like, I don't know. On my side, it's still saying that it's streaming, but is it really because Twitch is down or something? Like, is it because of a problem with Twitch? Like, really, at this time right now, when I'm doing my freaking uh, podcast, really? You know, like, you can't make the timing, like, any better? Seriously, I, I just find this to be weird. But uh, I'm just going to stay right now. I am so sorry. Like, I, I just want to apologize immediately. And at least, like, we will have YouTube where uh, we can go and interact uh, with the, like, like, if you have any additional comments, please let me know but honestly yeah this is just this is just messed up man it's like ah crap oh, hold on like I'll, I'll show you this right now uh to to show you what i mean here i'll, I'll prove this um moving this right over here like uh, i i i got this right now this is like how how twitch is right now and you could tell like nothing is happening like everything seems to be empty and i i still got internet just fine like the internet is still working out it's just for some reason, like, Twitch is just not working for me. Like, I'll, I'll even prove it. Like, uh, hold on. Let me go and add an additional website. We'll, we'll, we'll just go and look up uh, Trolls World Tour. World Tour. Yeah, I'll go and look it up. Just search it on Google. Yeah, it's, it's going fine. Like, I could go and check it out. Here, I'll go on IMDb. Yeah, it's a problem with Twitch. Uh, it's It has to be. It's just weird, honestly. And again, I, I definitely do apologize for this uh, technical difficulty. But then again, at least I can go and safely say that it is not because of me. So if you are listening to this in the future, uh, if you're listening to this either on YouTube or a podcast service or something like that, then let me know in the comments what are your opinions and what are your thoughts uh, on Trolls World Tour being the number one animation news story with the way that it has impacted film distribution forever.
And with that said, even with this awkward uh, thing that has happened on Twitch, I will go and fully conclude Animat's crazy cartoon cast with this episode. So I just want to say thank you all so much for listening. And thank you all so much for watching. It has definitely been a blast. And we are going to go and put things back to normal starting next week with this podcast. And hopefully we will go and move forward happily knowing that things can uh, at least... Um, hopefully get better in 2021. So with all that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for watching and thank you all so much for listening. And until next time, see you later, dudes.